Okay, Ridian, okay, uh, good afternoon. I'll, I'll leave you to the then. rest of your introduction. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, yes, thanks very much for inviting me to, uh, to talk on this conference today. Uh, my name is Rillian Jones. I'm originally from, from, from Wales and been based in Scotland for 20 years now. I work for SAC Consulting as a beef and sheep. Um. All participant lines have been muted. Press hash 6 to unmute your line. General talk. Um, uh, you know, trying to keep it fairly straightforward. There's no point overcomplicating things. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, with heifers, that you do have the flexibility um, with, with heifers to basically sell them at any sort of stage along the, the production cycle. Um, you know, for example, there could be heifers that, ha that haven't got in calf. You could be finishing them or selling them on as stores uh, or, or whatever. Um, but this talk is predominantly, obviously, about about, about finishing them, and um, so, so we'll focus on that from from now on. Um, as with many sort of systems, uh, what we're trying to achieve, obviously, is to make the, the, the highest margin from the cattle, not necessarily the highest uh, price per head. So, obviously, the, the importance of knowing your cost of production comes into it, as it would do with, with any other system. Um, heifers generally don't have the sort of scope to reach the sort of uh, weights that uh, bullocks or bulls can. But you know, if, if they're purchased well, uh, or if you, or if you've bred them yourself, um, then uh, and you've got the right system for the right type of cattle, then, then there could be a, a decent margin in there. Um, I think it's, it's also important to to mention at the start that um, I've been looking at some sort of more traditional targets for for finishing heifers, and I, I happen to know for a fact that, that there's a lot of modern continental cross cattle that are actually reaching um, weights that are actually quite a bit heavier than, than the sort of weights that we've traditionally uh, thought of. Uh, for example, a, a local farm to us here in the south of Scotland sold a batch of heifers just before Christmas there uh, to about 640 kilos, killing out about 355 kilos at uh, R3L on average. And that was at about 20 months of age. And these were Charolais cross heifers out of continental cross cows. So you know you do have the potential there uh, to get them to to to, to decent uh, to decent weights, but you know obviously the the missing figure that I don't have to to describe on that particular example is is the cost of production because they, you know the, the, then the, the correct point to sell them might have been slightly slightly lighter. Um, okay, um, there's a number of uh, of uh, booklets and things out there from Eblex amongst other other people. And uh, again, it's, you know, the importance of matching the, the right sort of type of animal that you have, whether it's the breed or the frame size, with the right sort of system. Uh, it, a lot depends on largely on what the sort of what the, the, the resources you have on your farm, in terms of you know whether it's a predominantly grassland-based uh, uh, um, farm uh, in the sort of west of the country, or whether you're, you're more likely to have access to, to arable crops or straw and cereals if you're uh, in more arable areas of the country. So, you know, the, the system that you choose uh, depends on what resources you have available on your farm, buildings, things like that as well. Um, and then obviously that will dictate the type of cattle that is best suited for you, you know, so that if you have a, a farm that is um, is, has to be a more of a forage grass based system then you would be better off perhaps buying heifers that are or, or finishing heifers rather that are uh, sort of smaller framed or more traditional breeds native breeds whereas if you have access to a lot of arable crops or, or um, you know cereals uh, and have good buildings then you know the, the options are become more realistic than to, 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 to be looking at continental cross heifers that tend to have a large, larger sort of frame size. Um, it, when it comes to the source of, of the cattle, obviously we, 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 we can talk about uh, suckler bred heifers uh, and we can talk about dairy bred heifers and in some parts of the country obviously the, the availability of dairy bred heifers is more than in other parts of the country. Uh, but again, you know, um, beef bred heifers from, from suckler, suckler herds Tend to be um, uh, generally tend to be spring-born. You know, there, there are, will be autumn-born uh, cattle as well, whereas dairy-bred cattle could really be born at any sort of time of the year. And again, you know, the the the, the source of the the cattle and the time of year that they're born m might also uh, dictate the sort of system that you might want to to run them on. So, for example, with spring-born uh, heifers, then you have the option of only having the one housing period. 
to finish them off grass uh, or certainly before they need housing for the second time. Uh, whereas with autumn uh, born cattle, then you tend to, to uh, you, know, you, will, you will inevitably have to have two housing periods and possibly two grazing periods as well. So, um, you know, so, so the, the, the source of cattle and, and when the time of year that they're born uh, also comes into the, the, the equation. Uh, just a few sort of general points, really, in terms of um, not just heifers, but any cattle, really, that it's obviously uh, more efficient to manage them in even-sized batches so that it makes nutrition, you know, rationing uh, and uh, treatments for any sort of uh, ailments and so on, preventative treatments, uh, more, more, more efficient. Uh, it's also better for the cattle themselves if they are all of a similar size in terms of things like feeding, um, you know, trough space and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and a few other factors then uh, when it comes to heifers are that um, compared to bullocks and bulls, they will have uh, higher levels of internal fat and there may be other development tissues as well uh, as they get closer to finishing, which will lead to a slightly lower killing out percentage, perhaps you know, a couple of points below what the equivalent uh, bullock or bull w w would achieve. Um, it's also important to realize, though, that while we often think of heifers as being slightly less efficient than bulls and bullocks, then they will generally be smaller, uh, um, so, so there will be reduced maintenance requirements uh, at that sort of similar age as well. Uh, other factors as well is um, as, as heifers get to you know, 12, 13, 14 months of age, there will be bullying activity going on, which can depress the, the appetites and growth rates and so on uh, at that particular time uh, as well. So, so all these things need to be uh, looked at. And as with any sort of system, I've already mentioned the fact that we should be knowing what our costs of production are. It's obviously easy, easier, I should say, uh, when you're buying in the feed. It's perhaps not quite so easy when uh, when it's homegrown fodder, but it's important to get as good a handle on that as possible. And also things like regular weighing and monitoring growth rates will help you to uh, to achieve good, good good results. But that's that's true for any for any system uh, of production. When it comes to <coughs> the um, the, the sort of phases of growth of, of, of beef cattle, I and mean, this is fairly uh, uh, um, uh, standard stuff, but um, we have the, the, the sort of rearing phase, when, uh, which is from birth to weaning, uh, when their diet is predominantly milk, and then obviously we need to transition them off milk onto a different diet. Um, and then it's important at this stage that that sort of uh, helps to... Um, uh, promote rumen development uh, uh, and so on, and, and, and uh, re reduce any sort of checks uh, that they might otherwise uh, get at weaning time. Um, and things like creep feeding obviously will come into that as well in the case of suckler bred uh, animals. The growing phase is perhaps the most important phase when it comes to finishing heifers, and this is when, because of the fact that they are um, uh, physiologically less uh, uh, likely to be lower in terms of overall uh, growth rates and finishing weights than bulls and bullocks, then I think it's important to match the growth, the growing phase correctly to uh, to ensure that uh, you you at least get some some moderately good uh, finishing weights um, because you have to have to 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 express their p full potential. They have to be uh, grown at a, a, a reasonable frame before before you put them on the finishing diet. So really at this sort of uh, uh, growing phase, heifers should probably, it, it depends on the breed type and so on, but should really be grown, grown on fairly slowly at about you know, 0.7 to 0.9 kilos a day, depending on the breed type. If they're smaller, the smaller the frame size, then perhaps grow them uh, smaller, slower rather, whereas uh, the larger framed sort of continent, continental types uh, can, can grow on at uh, a bit more, perhaps 0.9 or even a kilo a day. Um, and then the finishing phase, obviously, is the most expensive um, phase of the, 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 the operation, so it needs to be kept as short as possible. Uh, this will be uh, a lower protein diet, higher energy in starch, um, and with heifers, again, because of their sort of physiological uh, um, uh, reasons, then the, the finishing phase will need to be uh, 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 shorter or can be shorter than, than for um, uh, uh, the equivalent bull, bulls or bullocks. I think we need to talk a little bit about grassland management and gra grass finishing and so on. Um, 
I think grass finishing is very well suited to uh, spring-born uh, heifer calves um, and depending on the breed type uh, they can either be finished at grass uh, with, with very little supplementation at you know 16 to 18 months of age this would be more suitable for um, your sort of native uh, smaller um, earlier maturing type of cattle whereas um, finishing them slightly older at sort of heavier weights obviously with possibly a bit of supplementation at grass in late summer would be more suitable for your continental type uh, type cattle um, and for autumn born uh, cattle I think you know uh, uh, getting uh, 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 some good growth rates at grass to grow frame before perhaps it, it inside uh, finishing uh, is also uh, a good idea and certainly there's plenty of people now doing rotational grazing in paddocks and so on and the results uh, speak for themselves um, so really just to sort of um, summarize uh, the, the, the whole thing really um, what, if you get hold of the, the document that accompanies this, uh, this, this talk uh, there's a couple of tables at the end and what I've done is I've, I've suggested some uh, overall uh, live weight gains and finishing weights for you know small frame, medium frame, and large frame uh, animals. And I think you know the, your overall sort of growth rates for your small framed animals are probably going to be 0.8 kilos a day throughout, throughout its lifetime, whereas uh, the larger framed animals would be um, perhaps a kilo a day. Uh, and the, your smaller framed animals are probably likely to be finishing at around 500 kilos, possibly slightly more, depending on the animal whereas your larger framed animals will be, have got the potential certainly to reach up to 600 kilos. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, I know of examples of, of guys with, with continental cross heifers that are achieving you know, heavier, weight, heavier weights than this uh, in actual fact on, on farm. The second and final table on that, uh, on that uh, document uh, it's just a few very simple uh, typical diets for a house period uh, for a, a cattle of different types. And what I've suggested in that table is that for three different live weights, 300, 400, and 500 kilos, if they were fed ad libs, you know, reasonable quality silage and barley, uh, it, it suggests what the growth rate's uh, potential is for uh, the different uh, frame sizes of cattle. And you'll see from the table, we'll just look at the 400 kilo example uh, for now, that uh, a small, if they were fed ad lib silage in three and a half kilos of barley, your smaller framed sort of um, uh, cattle would grow at about 0.8 kilos a day, whereas your large frame cattle, just because of their sort of uh, advantages in terms of their physiology from being you know, larger framed and later maturing, can grow at <coughs> a, a kilo a day. And so that, that's just a little guide table, really. There's obviously a, a huge range of different um, diets and so on that could be uh, factored into the whole, the whole equation. Uh, so really, just to summarise, and um, I've got my watch here in front of me, and the time seems to have gone a lot quicker than I imagined, um, that uh, obviously the type of heifer that you, that, you, that, you, that, you, that you have will largely dictate the sort of systems and where you are in the country and what resources you have also comes into the into the mix. Um, so your larger framed animals, <coughs> which will typically be your later maturing continentals, will grow, will have faster growth rates, and you can take them to heavier weights. Whereas your smaller framed animals, you know, commonly you know your native breed sort of uh, traditional breed cattle, um, will will be slower growing. So you need to make sure that that they, 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 the, the growth phase is sufficient to get the, the maximum potential out of them. Um, I, think, I think that's it now, Chris, so I think I'll, I'll stop there if that's okay. That's fine. Can you hear me? I'll, 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 we've got a few yeah. questions. I mean, thanks, Rudy, and that's perfectly on time. <laughs> um, and just to remind you, the, the paper, the, the notes which Rydian's been referring to can be requested if you email to brpconf at eblex.ahdb.org.uk. So, Regan, you were just talking there about the, uh, the, the, the importance of a good uh, growing phase. What, what happens if animals, it's not, not always a perfect world, what happens if um, animals go through a growth check during that growing phase? Does that have any adverse effects on, uh, on their, uh, you know, their sort of finished weights or their, their finishing period? I think any sort of growth check, you know, you can minimise these growth checks, and the important times to do that are whenever there is a transition, you know, and gradual transition onto 
a different diet is important, whether it's from weaning to a, a growing ration or from growing on to finishing ration. If they do uh, suffer a check, then uh, there's obviously will be an economic impact to that because, uh, and, and it's, it's just one of those things that whether, you know whether it's for a health reason or whether it's poor quality feed or, or for injury or whatever. Unfortunately, uh, it, it probably will. I mean, they, they, they will they will be able to catch up, but it will obviously take longer, and um, perhaps there won't be uh, um, there will be an economic impact on that. So. The important thing there, I suppose, is to, is to try and minimise these uh, if effects, ha these growth checks happening at all. Like I said, it isn't a perfect world, um, and obviously there will always be uh, issues that, that do crop up from time to time, but it's important to do is do, is do what you can to minimise these things from happening. So avoid checks where possible, and where animals are moving from one ration or a feeding system to another, allow a period of adaptation generally speaking what would you be saying sort of a week to 10 days or slightly I would long? say yes I mean I mean uh, I suppose in a way it's whatever's practical and uh, at least a week pre preferably a bit longer perhaps and, mm. and certainly you know whether it if, if you're looking at um, you know, calves you know creep feeding calves for example would be uh, a, a good a good example once they're weaned then you keep them on a similar diet and, uh, and gradually change that over onto the growing ration and similarly, if they're coming off a, a higher forage a growing ration onto a, a sort of a lower forage, higher uh, starch uh, finishing ration, you do it gradually. And if you, like I said, if you do it over a period of seven to ten days, that will allow the rumen to acclimatise and should minimise any any adverse effects. That leads us perfectly into another question we've had in in terms of that period of change from growing to finishing ration. Mm -hmm. How do you know, you know, what's your gut feel in terms of, uh, you know, producers knowing when they need to be changing from that growing onto the finishing ration? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that the finishing ration is going to be the most expensive, uh, generally speaking, it will be the most expensive component of the ration. And so you don't want them to be on it uh, forever. Um, so you want to make sure that they are growing, the, 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 you know, knowing the type of cattle that you have, and what the potential is is important because you, you, you'll you'll get a feel for what the potential of of different types of cattle are based on previous experience and so on, and you'll know um, a lot of it does come down to the sort of skill of the the, the, the farmer in terms of uh, of having the right sort of animal for for his system. So you, let's say you don't really want the them to be on that finishing diet for too long. So probably for your uh, for your, even for your larger framed animals, they don't probably don't want to be on that finishing component for more than two to three months. Um, so really, you know, when 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 you think that they that, that they've they've reached the sort of frame the frame that that they that they need, and now you just need to flesh it out a bit, then that's the time to to, to do it. And obviously, if a smaller frame, then it'll be. Uh, quite a bit less than that, perhaps one to two months uh, on the finishing on the finishing uh, uh, component. Uh, and just one question um, regarding creep feeding. You mentioned that just now. Um, in terms of uh, suckling heifers, so these are heifers that are still suckling on their mothers, but you know they're destined for finishing. Would you say it's worth them being on an ad lib creep system at that stage prior to weaning, or or would you not recommend that? Um, I think creep feeding has a lot of benefits uh, in terms of, um, you know, as I've already said, you know, climatizing them to a different diet and also to minimize any sort of weaning checks. And it also helps to prevent issues with uh, you know, health issues uh, at, at housing and so on. And um, uh, but but there, having said that, you know, that I think it, it depends a lot on the, the type of cattle that you have. I, mean, I certainly think that for um, for your sort of larger frame, perhaps continental types, and it, you will get more, more benefit out of the, the creep feed. Uh, if you have native breeds and you're, and you're finishing them extensively on the farm, perhaps it's not such an easy uh, an easy decision to make, and you pr can perhaps uh, you know, the, the, there isn't such a need perhaps for them to be creep fed. It all depends on what the system that they're, they're, they're destined for, I suppose. That's the, that's yeah. the, the, the truth. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, we've, we've had a few questions come in. Uh, so can I just remind you, if you've, if you've had a question stimulated by what Rydian said, you can email us on brpconf, C-O-N-F, at eblex.ahdb.org.uk. We'll, we'll pause there, Rydian, and I'll bring Debbie in. Debbie, are you okay. with us? Yes. Yeah. 
Hey, but we'll, we'll hand over to Debbie now for her her talk on actually rearing heifers for breeding uh, for for spring mating. I think that's the topic, Deb. And then we'll come back to questions to both of you at the end. So if you've still got questions for Rivian, email them in, please, and I'll ask the questions at the end of Debbie's piece. But also email your questions in for Debbie. So over to you, Deb. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, as Chris said, we're um, going to be looking or talking a little bit about managing replacement heifers for service this spring. Um, we're quite close to spring now, so there's not a lot we can do about the very start of the rearing period, but it's something to consider and something to look at this year with consideration to the future. How well grown are these heifers already? And um, could they be better grown? or How are they going to manage afterwards? They are... You know, the lifeblood of your suckle herd replacement heifers, whether they are homebred or bought in, um, they are what is going to make the future of your suckle herd. And they offer a valuable opportunity to bring in new genetics and improve herd productivity. So we need to make sure we manage these animals well and select them correctly. There are various considerations we need to look at. The first one that I would always think about, really, um, is whether these animals are homebred or whether they're purchased. If we purchase heifers, theoretically, they present a higher risk of bringing in disease to a herd than homebred heifers do. But we need to know what the status of the, home, of the health status of our own herd is so that we know what risk there is from our, of our homebred heifers picking anything up as well. If we're buying in heifers for service this spring, then we need to think about whether we should already have those animals on farm or we need to consider the timing of what we might need to do before they come in, whether that be time for mixing with our own animals, vaccinations, any testing for any diseases we might need to do. And we also need to think about the fact that nutrition, social group changes and environmental changes are all stresses on these animals. And if we bring them in too close um, to service period, that might impact on fertility. We're talking about disease risks, what are the main disease risks within the herd? Well, there are various ones that will affect fertility and will also affect future production in these animals. Yonis, BVD, Lepto and IBR are the main ones that sort of jump to mind. Um, you know, if you're, you know your herd status, do you test any heifers that you buy in so that you know whether they're going to be a problem or not. Um, make sure that testing is carried out well in advance of service period so we don't bring in any heifers that could then potentially affect the fertility of other heifers already on the farm or other heifers in the group. If vaccination protocol is carried out on farm, which for BVD, Lepto and IBR is key, the heifers need to have completed that vaccination at least four weeks prior to service. And if we do it too close to service, then it's going to affect how well these heifers, one, amount the immune response to the vaccines, but also how well they might conceive as well. So getting it in in plenty of time to give these heifers the best chance is always going to be ideal. As far as yonis is concerned, if it's something that is an issue on a farm, if you're breeding your own heifers and you're not doing any testing, then there's a risk that you could have problems later on with these heifers, and maybe a whole batch may end up being a problem on the farm. And rearing your own heifers can suddenly increase the amount of problems that you see because a whole batch can go down with the disease later on after calving. So it's something to bear in mind and try and have an indication of what's in your cows to start with. If you're rearing your own heifers, then you want to be really selecting those based on their growth rate up to weaning. We need to look at them so that we know that they're going to be big enough and they're growing well enough. And ideally, we want all our heifers to calve by two years of age because the ones that are on for longer than that are there taking up space, are costing you feed, and they should be there producing for you. So if we can get these heifers growing well to start with, then we're going to have more chance of them calving successfully at two years of age. The early part, that growth rate up to weaning, is a time when they should do efficient growth and be able to get some of the decent growth onto them without costing um, as much money as it will do later with feed. We also need to bear in mind the soundness of these cattle, um, their sort of strength and um, structure to them. Are they lame? How good are their legs and feet? What's the temperament like? And what is their live weight relative to target when we get closer to service? Heifers that are born early in the calving period usually are the best heifers replacements. Not only will they be well grown and likely to reach the target surface weight, but hopefully their, cat, their mothers are more fertile, so hopefully that feeds through a little bit and the heifers will be more fertile as well. On the um, 
sheet if you want the notes at the end there is a indication in a table at the bottom which gives some ideas of where you should be looking for for target weights for first service um start of second breeding season start of third service third breeding season so we make sure that these animals are growing well enough to achieve the weight we want relative to mature cow weight and it's good to look at your mature cows and have a, and get an idea of what sort of weights they are as an average and by the time we get to this spring and we're serving these heifers, they should be 65% of that mature body weight so that we can get um, th- keep them growing well so that, and give them the best chance to move forward into the herd. The important thing is, though, that heifers quite often will get fed or will do quite well and will end up too fat too soon. And keeping them lean through this service period is really important. It, keeping them lean will help in various ways because laying down fat will cause more problems later on when they get closer to calving. It affects the liver function, which can have an impact on um, energy metabolism and what they do after calving. And a lot of people will say that heifers at calve at two struggle after that. And they do need a little bit of help because we've got to remember they still need to grow. But if we can keep them leaner up to first service, then they tend... um, then they tend to keep going better and don't get quite as fit and getting calf easier as well. There's less fat generally on the internal organs, including around the ovaries as well. So this helps to just make sure the fertility is as good as it can be in the spring. We need to keep the protein levels of our diet up so that we keep them that little bit leaner and we don't overdo energy. And this is really important to make sure we achieve the growth rates we want And to really have an idea of what we're doing, we need to be looking at them now for condition and also weighing them just so we get an indication now of where they are and what we need to be doing for the next few months. As we get closer to uh, service period, we can then increase that level of feeding, which in some ways gives it a little bit of a flushing sort of um, effect, just so that they have got more chance of getting in calf. And making sure that we get the best conception out of these heifers as possible in a shorter service period as we can do. We also then need to consider when we get to the spring, how are we going to serve these heifers? What are we going to use on them as far as a bull's concerned? And how um, how are we going to go around that? Do we have a bull that's usable on our heifers? Or are we going to look at artificial insemination so that we can maybe bring in new genetics into the herd without having another bull. Or if we're using a bull, can we look? have we looked at what bull we're going to use? Have we looked at EBVs so that we know that we're going to get some improved genetics on the farm and start to aim towards a herd of what we were trying to um, get at the end of the day? We need to, um, if using artificial insemination, we need to discuss it in plenty of time what different options are available for making sure we see these heifers bulling so that we can get them served. It's a good idea to speak to your vet if you're thinking of using synchronisation programmes because you need some planning and attention to detail to make sure we achieve good conception rates. It might be that we um, we need to look at different handling systems and other things like that. So it's not just looking at the heifers, it's looking at the management so that we can really optimise the chance of these heifers of getting uh, conceiving. If we're using a bull, we need to think about which sire we're going to use. And it's really important that we choose um, semen from a bull as good EBVs for calving ease because we don't want calving problems in these heifers or they're going to struggle next time round. If we're going to buy a bull, then we need to make sure we've got it on farm at least three months before the mating period because we need to allow it to acclimatise Health and fertility testing need to be carried out. Um, If we've got at least 10 weeks before the service period, we can fertility test these bulls, then we've got chance to do something about it if they're not quite right. It's too late once the bull goes in and we find that the heifers are coming over. In an ideal world, the heifers will only have six weeks with the bull um, as a service period and we need them to get in calf in that time to give them the be- best chance moving forward into the herd. Prior to mating, all breeding cattle should be checked and treated if there are any issues with lameness, worms, fluke or any other problems along those sort of lines to give them plenty of time for full recovery and now's a good time to be doing that 
um, get these heifers out, have a look at them. Are they sound? Do they need to go through a foot bath? Do they need their feet checking? Um, have they been dosed for worms or fluke this back end since they came in? Um, or do they need some? What condition are they in? Is there anything else that they're just not looking quite right that we need to be giving, getting on top of now so that by the time we get to the spring, the stress is minimal and these heifers are just ready to go out and, and conceive for us. When we're looking at the nutrition of these heifers, we've got to optimise the diets to make sure we get a continuous growth and, and so we get good fertility. The target really would be to get them in a body condition score of no more than three by the time they're calving. So we need to keep them lean so we can move them forward towards that. Once they're in calf, they'll lay down fat easier. So if we can keep them leaner earlier, then it's easier to keep them from getting too fat as they get closer to calving. They're good. We need good quality protein and energy so that we make sure that we can target exactly what we're trying to achieve with this growth and for the service. And when we get round to service, we need to totally minimise stress and reduce as many changes on, on the uh, in these heifers as we possibly can. We need to consider our mineral and vitamin supplementation as well. What what needs do we actually have on farm? Do we have any um, underlying problems that might affect fertility? Um, think about manganese, selenium, iodine. Um, and if we need to be supplementing for these, what's the easiest way to be doing it? And can we make sure that whatever we're doing, we've got in plenty of time, at least six weeks prior to the service period, to make sure that these heifers have got as much chance as possible. So really, in sort of conclusion of what I've sort of been talking about, we need to be getting in among these heifers now to give us a chance to have a look at them. Do we know what vaccines that they've had? Can we make sure that they are fully vaccinated now, ready for going to service in the spring? Have we tested them for any risk of any diseases that might affect fertility? What size and weight are they? Are we happy with their body condition, ready for going to service? Can we adjust that now in plenty of time before we get to that service period? Have we got a bull on farm or are we going to use the artificial insemination? Whichever one, are we ready and set up for using the different fertility programs um, or making sure that these heifers are going to get served successfully? Where are we going to serve them? What, how are we going to manage that period? Have a look at them. Make sure they're walking soundly. And make sure they've been dosed for fluke and worms as necessary and any other issues that might be arising on farm. And have we checked the nutrition are we, what forage are we feeding? Have we tested the forage and make sure that whatever else we're giving alongside it is optimising that growth and ensuring these heifers are in best condition, ready for the spring, so we get as many of these heifers in calf within that six weeks as possible. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much, Deb. And bang on time. Thank you very much. That makes my job easy. Uh, we, we've had some questions come in. Um, yeah. Just... Uh, there during the course of the presentation during the course of your talk there you talked about vaccination uh yeah. a good warning there to make sure that all vaccinations are done for i wrote down four weeks prior to service was it prior to service yeah yeah they certainly need to be finished by that time and uh sorry if this is a naive question but no, it's all right. are, there, are you able to use multiple vaccines so if you're trying to sort of uh cure several things at once or prevent several things at once are you able to use more than one vaccine at once what's your advice there the, things like bdd you, and ibr or yeah usually the advice would be that you can do two of them it depends a little bit on the um recommendations of the vaccine pr uh, manufacturer but a lot of them you can do two together but they wouldn't advise doing more than two so you could do bvd and ibr but you'd probably want to do lepto a fortnight different but rather than doing all three at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does, that does. Um, and the other, again, I picked up during the course of the presentation, you were talking about uh, tight carving patterns. Would it yeah. generally be good sense to try and favour heifers, assuming everything else is fine with them, favour heifers that are born early on from your cows in their normal, in the normal sort of carving period, because they're, a, they're going to be bigger and everything else when you come to wean them, but are they likely to be more genetically prone, uh, you know, sort of positive for breeding? 
it's certainly the experience I've seen on farm that certainly seems to pay off. So definitely, if you go for those that are born earlier in the calving period, they do tend to seem to do better going forward at getting in calf quicker as well. Uh, the question come in here about first-time carvers. Um, <clears throat> why do some first-time carvers fail to get in calf again quickly after carving? Usually it's because we forget that they're still growing after they've carved that first time. So even if they've carved successfully and got going, we tend to then, a lot of the time, they'll get stuck in with the rest of the herd um, and just get grazed wherever the rest of the herd's grazing. And we forget about giving them a little bit of extra nutrition if they need it or prioritising grazing. So we've got to remember they've still got a lot more requirement for growth as well as rearing a calf and getting back in calf again. So the important thing is if we're going to carve... Um, and it's usually the younger carvers that have that problem. If we're going to carve them at two years of age, it's just making sure that we do look after them and make sure they keep moving forward. Um, I'm just sort of running, working out the order of the questions now. Um, one here regarding... Uh, sorry, the, the question I was going to ask was, uh, leading up to carving, um, would you tend to sort of favour heifers in terms of nutrition in the couple of weeks leading up to carving to sort of boost, boost milk production and colostrum and so on, or would you, would you not bother with heifers? I would I would still concentrate on heifers as well as cows for that um, because they need to keep growing, but they also need to be able to produce milk and colostrum. So giving them the chance um, to have a, some decent quality protein and some a little bit of extra energy just to make sure that they get everything that they need as they get closer to carving will be um, ideal. Mm. Uh, in terms of selecting heifers, Deb, if you're bringing, if you're selecting your own heifers, is it worth yes. considering pelvic measurement scoring uh, in your selection criteria? It's something that's uh, talked about more and more. It's not something I've had a horrendous lot of experience about, I'll be honest, but I think it's something worth looking at because it does seem to have an effect on um, ease of carving. So I think it's probably something that's worth considering. I don't want to push you on something you're not comfortable on, but is there a lay person way of measuring pelvic measurement? I mean, do you literally get a ruler out and go across the thin bones or...? I'll be 100% honest, I don't know enough about it, Chris, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe one will come back to another time. Um, uh, in terms of buying in replacements then, what are your thoughts on buying in replacements from the dairy herd? Any recommendations there? The important thing, I think, is maybe getting an idea of the source, if you can, as to where they're coming from. There there are positives and negatives towards it. The the positives towards it are generally milk production will be quite good um, because they're, they've got some of that um, dairy breeding in there as well. Um, they're also an easier sourced heifer. The, the negatives are that a lot of the time um, dairy cows will be put to beef because they've had other issues going on. So it's a control method for removing other diseases, but also um, for cows that don't get in calf so easily uh, to the Holstein straw, to a black and white straw or whatever, um, then go to beef. Now that's changing a little bit with the way the dairy industry is going and a lot more will go to beef earlier, um, but generally that's the outcome. So you almost could be leading to getting the more problem cows that the he these hef beef heifers are then coming out of, which potentially could lead to more problems going forward into the beef herd. But I suppose there, the key there is, if you're able to, have a relationship with the guy you're buying from. With the again. guy you're buying from, yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Or do a bit of digging if you can't, just to try yeah. and get an idea. We had uh, a guy in our progressive beef group who was desperate to buy in batches of car, uh, sort of heifers from a dairy herd and in that case would actually be prepared to pay a premium for making sure that the right bulls were used in terms of AI yeah. and the right protocols for health and so on because he knew what he was buying in. So I suppose it's just what you can find and who you know. And uh, Yeah, and I think that is happening a little bit more around and about. I'm certainly seeing a little bit more where the dairy, um, my, some of the dairy farmers are actually um, serving to suit for the beef offspring that they need to provide for local farmers for the suckle herd as well. So, okay, well, good luck everybody with that one. Um, just a bit of a bit of a detailed one here, Deb. It's to do with nutrition of heifers over winter. 
Yeah. So these are heifers that have been weaned in the autumn. Um, they're going to be served in the spring. They're on a moderate quality silage of about of 10.8 megajoules of ME. Yeah. What supplementation would these heifers, in, in terms of thinking about bringing them ready round to service this spring, what sort of supplementation would you recommend on that kind of silage? They, they're likely to need something just to keep them growing well enough. The, the, the biggest problem really is keeping the protein level up and good quality protein in there so that they keep growing well, um, really well. They'll probably meet energy requirement if they eat enough of that silage to get enough en megajoules into them, but they're likely to be a bit short on protein depending on the protein of that silage. 